So welcome everyone. Uh, as Justin said, it's been a little bit of a hiatus for us. Uh, so it's lovely to be back doing the PhD chats. Um, since we, many of some of you, I know, um, I see some familiar names, but uh, I'm guessing at least some of you are new to this. Let me just say a little couple of words about what we were trying to do here. Uh, so we started this two years ago where the idea was that, you know, we have a large number of members, SMS members who are PhD students, and we wanted to create a forum where, you know, they could talk to senior faculty at other schools, uh, maybe get a perspective different from those of your advisors or your committee on topics that are of general interest to PhD students uh, and, you know, get some sort of general advice, but also have the opportunity to sort of talk to people about specific questions that you might have. And so in that spirit, um, the idea here is we'll, we'll spend about an hour uh, we do have a set of questions uh, that, that you've submitted when you registered. We're going to spend, spend an hour doing a kind of discussion among the panel of these questions, more of a curated discussion. That part of the seven webinar will be recorded and will be available in the SMS website uh, and, the, and the membership circle. Um, but then we're going to take the last half an hour, we're going to shut down the recording and we're going to let you ask whatever specific questions you have. And as the name of the CV suggests, it's a PhD chat. We are not going to be terribly formal. This is probably the longest I've gone without making a joke um, on a <laughs> webinar ever. Um, so um, this is really meant to be an informal session that's supposed to be helpful to you. And so that's really the spirit. Uh, in that spirit, I am, um, and, and of course, as you know, this today's session, we're going to be focusing really on the topic of teaching uh, and, and how to learn how to teach while you're a PhD student. Um, and in that context, I'm 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 delighted to welcome uh, uh, Professor Sabine Bauman from the Berlin School of Economics and Law, uh, uh, who is also uh, the I think current chair for the teaching community at SMS. Uh, so she's been doing, and her community has been doing wonderful work helping our members, uh, you know, learn about more about teaching. And I strongly encourage you to check out some of their content online as well. Uh, and also Henning Piazunka, uh, who's at INSEAD. Uh, and, uh, you know, also uh, has been a, you know, star teacher and, I, I, I you know, also helps with teaching at a, another professional association that shall not be named since we are on an SMS webinar. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I'm, I'm also delighted to welcome uh, uh, my co-host, who, of course, is on a, always on a tropical island somewhere, uh, although for a while you were in a desert, but anyway, um, uh, Samina Karim uh, from, from Northeastern. Um, so just to kick us off, um, I think um, I think the first topic maybe to talk about, and and I'm going to just put this out as a question uh, that either Henning or Sabine can 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 pick up. Um, I mean, I think the first obvious question, just to be provocative, is to say, well, if you're a PhD student, why bother about teaching at all, right? So why is it? I mean, after all, the PhD is all about research. Uh, shouldn't we just be focusing on research? What is the importance of why should we be thinking about teaching? Uh, and, and particularly, you know, if you think back on your own PhD experiences, what role did teaching play uh, in that, in that uh, setting? So either uh, Sabine Henning, whoever, whichever one of you wants to start, up to you. Yeah, I, I can start if, if, if you like. So um, thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me and uh, also for allowing the teaching community to co-host uh, the session, it's great to reach out to PhD students and uh, um, you asked about the importance of teaching. So for, for one thing, when you look at careers, not everyone will end up at a um, research institution. So you may sort of go, be going to a teaching school and so the focus uh, there will be very much on teaching. If you look at uh, how many business schools earn their money, it's also based on teaching. Um, and um, I, but I think the most important thing is that we also, as um, educators, um, you know, educating young professionals, young students um, is sort of really part of our mission um, and sort of super, super enjoyable. So it's not just about doing it, it's also you're getting something, something back. Yeah, so... So, so building up on what Sabine said in the end, I, I always show the students a chart at the end when I'm done with teaching. And we said like, look, we had 15, we had 50 students this term. We had 10 sessions and each session is four hours. Okay. And if you add this up, this means I control 2000 hours of lifetime. Right. And I find this just an enormous amount of time. Right. 
And so I'm basically in charge that 2000 hours of lifetime are spent in a kind of way that kind of makes sense, where people get joy out of it, where people learn something, whatever. And so I would, I would say like, look, you just have an enormous amount of responsibility and responsibility can be a joy. It can be, but it is a responsibility. You better kind of, you better kind of take good care of because the people you kind of educate take an enormous amount of time of their life and they're very often the savings of themselves and the savings of their family. Um, that's one thing. Um, so, so it's just important. So take it serious. Um, the second thing is, look, I enjoy research, but I find it's not energizing to deal with reviewer two and work for three months on a particular footnote. I mean, maybe it is for you, but it's not, it's not for me. Okay. Um, and so teaching, you see like Bob Sutton, um, I feel like I got like a good amount of my wisdom from, from Bob Sutton at Stanford. And he has this beautiful saying, um, it takes as much energy to be a bad teacher as it takes energy to be a good teacher. Um, and if you walk out of the classroom with a standing ovation, um, that's much better than the dean coming to you and say like, oh, there's a problem with your teaching load and with your teaching ratings. Um, so um, you just have a much easier life if you take your teaching serious, okay? And, and you know, like, I enjoy my teaching. Like, if you gave me an opportunity to teach tomorrow, I would be like, hey, this is great. Um, let me kind of do this. So, so it's just something I think which is good to devote your life to. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's an honor in, in a way that, um, you know, young people allow allow us to sort of educate them. So I I fully agree with what you're saying, Henning, that it is super important. Can I ask Sabine and Henning, did either of you teach during your PhD program? Mm -hmm. I did. Um, yeah, not a lot, not a lot. Uh, I did my PhD in, in Germany, uh, where you don't teach that much. Um, and um, in my time, the PhD program was less formalized than PhD programs sort of tend to be today. But I have to say, I always enjoyed it. And especially because you're in, in age, you're so much closer to, um, to the students. I actually felt it was a little easier than moving into the professor role later, where also the expectations somehow increase because you were like more on a peer level. Um, beforehand, um, but I have to say, ultimately, I enjoy the professor professor role more because you also have a bit more sort of influence, and also you have a wider scope on what you're actually teaching. I did my go ahead a tiny, a tiny bit, mostly TAing. So mm -hmm. I sat in professors' classes and dealt with the things they didn't want to deal with. I taught at at Michigan. We had to teach. Uh, and we taught the undergraduate seniors in a capstone course. And I found that experience invaluable because one, it was like having training wheels on a bicycle because it was part of a, you know, many sections of a class where I could learn from someone else's, you know, set syllabus, learn from other per people's slides and notes on how to teach cases or even just a discussion on theory and readings. Um, but also to learn how to deal with some other social interactions of teaching. You know, I was a not at that tall Asian woman having some large men football players in my class. You know, just some of those dynamics of teaching or having a large class or a small class, trying to get students to participate. All of that with the training wheels on, I, I felt like it was, it, you're always going to not be as good of a teacher the first time you do it always you always improve and so you know i think that it's better to do it earlier before you're really judged for a something like a promotion right so it, it's safer to do it in your phd henning i would like to say one more thing about the importance of teaching which i think is completely underestimated okay mm -hmm. and i don't think it's a great thing to say but i think it's a good thing to keep in mind um there are not a ton of people out there who read a ton of academic articles um, a very important way to communicate your research is by presenting it. Um, and if you are a good presenter, if you do well at SMS and other conferences, okay, um, it will do you a great good. It will help you to get jobs. It will help get your attention for, for, for your research and things like that. Um, I don't think there's... I wouldn't be surprised if we ran a regression and we would look at like citations as an outcome. 
Um, and we would control for kind of research and just add like presentation ability. That presentation ability has a very, very positive effect. Okay. Um, so I think that's um, your ability to kind of stand in front of a room and kind of command an audience is a very, very important aspect in terms of research. And I think teaching is an enormous way to, is, is fantastic way to train that. Uh, I think there are very, very few people who are really good in commanding an academic presentation, but then completely suck at teaching. I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but I think that would be a total outlier. And I think there's an enormous training effect between the two. Asim, did you teach while, while in the PhD program? I did. Um, and, you know, again, I think I would echo a lot of, um, a lot of the sentiments here. I mean, uh, I think from a somewhat more, I'm not really big on principle, but uh, from a more pragmatic, from a more pragmatic perspective, I think it really just, it just meant that my first few years as an assistant professor, I wasn't sort of super stressed out about teaching. I was, I was pretty confident I'd already done it. I kind of, I went into the classroom prepared for what I had to do. And I, and, you know, I, I got high good ratings right, right to begin with, and I didn't have to think about it. Right. And I think that was a tremendous advantage because I've seen uh, over the years, you know, a lot of assistant professors spend a lot of their time. I mean, you know, tenure clocks are short. And if you're spending a lot of your time, I mean, I'm not taking away from all the other things that have been said, but I think even if you are really, you think you're a researcher and you're, you're really focused on that, your ability to focus on that comes from being able to do a good enough job on teaching. Uh, and I think it really helps to have done some of this in the PhD program. I, I do want to keep us moving. So um, I guess, you know, uh, uh, since we, we've just been talking about how, you know, people have different levels of sort of, but most of us don't get a whole lot of, um, you know, training in teaching uh, in the PhD program. So uh, again, this is for the panel. Um, you know, as you think about making and maybe Henning, you know, since I guess you did very little teaching in your PhD program, as you make that transition to being a professor and you have to prepare new courses, how do you go? How do you go about doing that? How 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 should people think about, you know, how do you prepare for teaching if you haven't had the opportunity, especially if you haven't had the opportunity to teach in the PhD program? So one thing I find tremendously helpful is to sit in other people's classes. So so you learn vicariously. You sit in other people's classes, you see what they do, um, and you get like a feeling, you know, you get a feeling for things that work for you, that don't work for you and stuff like that. So I um, I saw a lot of teachers at INSEAD and I got a very good feeling for, oh, this is a style that works for me. That's not a style that works for me. Um, so, so that I think is important. Um, the second advice, the second advice I would give, this is probably my main advice, teach a class you would enjoy taking. If, if you don't enjoy it, then it really sucks. It's very unlikely that if you don't enjoy the content, if you don't like the slide, if you think the slide is boring, that other people are gonna like it. The fact that you like it doesn't mean that other like it, but if you don't like it, it's really unlikely that other people will like it. Um, the third thing is, and this is, a, um, I'm kind of only kind of passing on kind of advice from the, from the elders here. Um, but Gaudam gave me, Gaudam Ahuja gave me fantastic advice, which I, um, and Gaudam said something to me, which I thought was completely nonsensical and in retrospect makes total sense to me. He said like, in your first year, you just invest an enormous amount of time in teaching. And I thought that was stupid because I felt like, shit, I need these papers and blah, 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 blah. But the thing about it is, um, if you nail teaching in the beginning, you have a relatively smooth sailing across for the next few years and potentially throughout the rest of your career because you kind of know what you're doing you have like a positive association with it um so um i would be on the side of investing too much time and to say like you know what um i put a lot of effort in it you might test run it you see like um i haven't done this but i've I've, I've, yeah, no, I've done this in some setting. I actually kind of test taught stuff. Like I wouldn't teach the first time the session if I kind of walk into a full MBA classroom, but I test taught a little bit with like doctoral students and stuff like that. Yeah, these are my two cents. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with what Henning um, said um, because preparation is sort of one thing, but there's also, um, I would also send out a warning if you over prepare 
you might get stuck in your thoughts because you always have to leave room for the unexpected. Um, and the unexpected is essentially what makes teaching fun. To teaching, you know, to, to find a ball that someone throws at you uh, all of a sudden and sort of turn that in, into something fun. And if you just keep to something you have prepared into your schedule, then you sometimes end up, um, you know, as, as being too disciplined, too muted. Um, so I, you know, I over, and this is also something I had to learn to really let go and to have let the magic, uh, of, you know, take place. Um, and it's quite okay, um, you know, if things sort of don't happen according to plan, because that is really where the magic might happen. So, you know, trust yourselves. I mean, you've been there. And as Henning said, if you don't enjoy, you know, what you're doing, there's a high chance that others uh, will, you know, won't enjoy it either. Yeah. And, and I would add, I mean, you know, just thinking back on my own experience, um, I, I think one of the nice things about teaching is that there's a lot of material available uh, mm -hmm. if you're starting, right? So, uh, people are usually pretty happy to share syllabi. People, I mean, actually, there's a number of repositories that you can always tap into. Uh, when I moved from Wharton, uh, I, I actually collected a bunch of syllabi from, from people who were teaching courses that I knew I might have to teach. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, so I, I mean, I, I say that because I think as PhD, as researchers, I think we have this focus of saying, I have to do something, you know, what's my contribution? What am I doing that's different from what people are doing? But in some sense in teaching, you don't need that. It's not like you have to come up with a completely new teaching method to, to right? It's it's actually good to, again, reflecting on sort of Henning's point about learning from others. Um, and so at least I found it quite useful to see what other people were doing to compare you know, different syllabi and different approaches, not just in terms of the actual classroom, but even in terms of the material that was assigned, in terms of the grading criteria, et cetera, and then just put together a course that I felt comfortable kind of dealing with. And so I think, uh, I, I know we had a number of questions in the in the initial sort of setup about, you know, how do you prepare a new course? How do you, you never taught a top topic before, how do you go about developing a course? Mm -hmm. And I think really it's about leaning heavily on, on people and and I I know if I mean I know people email me and I guess this is an offer. Um, people email me all the time saying, "Hey, uh, I see you are teaching this course. Do you mind sharing your syllabus?" And I'm always happy to do that. Uh, and then sometimes I've been you know okay sharing material, other material, etc. So you know I think you will find I find people are usually pretty happy uh, uh, sharing uh, content uh, for teaching. Um, Sabina, do you want to? Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate something Henning said. The best advice I had was to watch others teach and have them watch me. And so my wisdom came from Anita McGann. And Anita said, have, you know, four people watch you teach and you watch four others. Of course, I loved watching the four other professors teach. And I was scared to death when I had four senior professors come watch me teach, including Anita. But I learned so much, not only in style, um, how they used humor, how they used a balance of the board and slides. You know, everybody has a different way of doing this. Um, I remember learning from Anita, you know, if you want to stress a, and highlight a point that a student is making, you walk towards the student to kind of legitimate more what they're saying. If you want students to maybe ignore a little bit more what someone is saying, if it's tangential, you walk away, right? These are just tricks of the trade, um, but you learn by watching others. Um, one last point I'll mention is one professor who watched me teach mentioned that it sounded like I was yelling at my students. I was like, what do you mean? And it turned out we were in this case room and I used to sing, so I'm used to projecting. And you don't need to project in these rooms because they're acoustically set so you can speak at a regular speaking volume. And I didn't know that my first semester teaching in this huge case room um, so you, you might learn things that you didn't even know. So, all right, let's move on. Um, we've all taught different levels of students, undergraduates, MBA. Um, let's focus on those two, not executives right now. Do you have tips on differences in um, actually teaching these different populations? Either best practices or things you've noticed? I've never taught undergrads. You never taught undergrads. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that when it comes to say preparation and, and being in class, I don't find it that much uh, different. Um, 
because at the end of the day, we are all humans interested in a particular topic. Um, with uh, graduate students, of course, you can sort of build on pre-existing knowledge, or sometimes you can't build on pre-existing knowledge if they come from sort of different, different backgrounds. I think the main difference will, is that in undergraduate, you very often have um, larger classes um, and often a higher heterogeneity across um, sort of the, the groups you're teaching, but I also, you know, enjoy it tremendously. So I really like to sort of move between the different different groups. But I think in, in terms of how I prepare, in terms of how I go into the classroom, um, it, 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 I don't think it's that much of a difference. I think that the big difference is with executive teaching. So I think I really, but, you know, as I said, we will be sticking with the other two groups um, it's more about sort of the course content that you would be teaching, but not so much sort of my general teaching approach. I've, I've talked a little bit of something, but I'm going to say one thing about it, which I, which I think is very important. Um, in Basically independent. I think the most important thing you do in teaching is listening. Um, and so, so one thing I always assume is that my student really listened to me. And if, if you're not worried whether people, somebody listens, but you worry that somebody listens, you actually start watching out very carefully what comes out of your mouth. Because you think like, oh my God, that person might actually listen to me and might make decisions based upon what I'm saying now. The second thing, and that I think gets more important, the, the kind of more senior the people become you teach, um, is that you need to listen to them. And if you actually listen to them and really kind of engage with their responses and with their worries, it makes an enormous kind of difference. Um, so, and the, the, the more senior the people are, the more they have probably have to say, the more questions they have. I'm not, not sure I would agree with that. Um, it might be different questions. But yeah, I mean, fair, fair, fair. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, as I said, it's, it's sort of probably, you know, in terms of course content, there will be differences. Um, but um, when it comes to the expectations that the students have toward, you know, for, for you as a professor, I think that's, you know, I think it's a different level, but I mean, the general approach will be fairly similar. But I, I fully agree with what Henning said, listen to your students. I mean, I always, um, you know, after my first week of teaching a particular group, I very often go back <laughs> to, to my course content and make some changes because I'm feeling maybe there's some catch up I will have to do, or you know they're already more advanced than I anticipated, or they may have thrown sort of topics my way. And I think, wow, this sounds great. Um, let's, you know, how can I incorporate this in, into the, the class? And it gives me a much better idea on who is my audience um, and, and you know what what might they need um, in terms of my approach. Asim, you have any tricks between undergrads and MBA? I mean, I in my experience, I think the I mean, I think the big difference, uh, at least with the uh, students here at Carlson and, and actually even at Wharton, because uh, I did teach a little bit there, um, is just the level of experience they have with real organizations, uh, and I think that then so that has two implications. On the one hand, it means that I I find teaching MBAs, I'm able to leverage their experience a lot more right i mean going back to sort of sabine's point about sometimes you get this question that it's like right so the opportunity to sort of open it up and say let's have a discussion you know like uh, instead of me providing an example of something i'll say has anybody seen this in their organization and three hands will go up saying yeah exactly this happened to me um i think the flip side of that is i think Again, and I, so I do think it's, you know, listening to the undergrad, I mean, so I obviously I totally agree with the notion of listening to your students. I think sometimes, especially, you know, for someone like me who came out of industry, who was a consultant for a while, uh, you know, I, I think teaching undergrads, I took for granted that they understood a lot of things. And then sort of three sessions in, I was like, oh, wow, you don't know what profit is. You've never read a profit and loss statement. Okay, now I have to kind of rethink, right? So again, uh, to, to Sabine's point about sort of rethinking uh, in my experience, it's actually the other way around. I tend to assume people have a lot of advanced knowledge and then it sort of occurs to me, oh, they don't understand. Uh, or, or sometimes I tend to assume that they have a lot of, you know, an economics background. So 
you know, they understand what what a cost curve means or what fix, how fixed costs are different from variable costs. And it's actually quite surprising to me sometimes why they don't. Uh, and so, you know, I think just, just being careful to not kind of like, you know, watching out for students. And again, you know, a lot of them will, but some of them won't, and then they'll feel really left behind. So I think, I think just being kind of calibrating the discussion to make sure that you're carrying everyone along uh, and and not relying on, I mean, I think, because I, again, I like Henning, I, I spent, I think the first 10 years of my career just teaching MBAs and then I started teaching undergrads and that was quite a, it was quite a shock because it was Definitely. like, wow, these people really don't talk and they really don't have any experiences to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, I had to sort of adjust that. But but otherwise, actually, I find the the actual course, I mean, I would love to say, you know, senior, and I mean, I know we're not talking about execs, but I would love to say senior managers have a deeper understanding of core concepts, but I actually don't think that's true. I think they're just as confused and just as lost. So I think the basic content uh, is is actually not that dissimilar. I think, I mean, of course, there's some existing knowledge that they might have if you're teaching an MBA program, but I think more, it's more about the delivery in my experience where it's really about, you know, either leveraging their experience or compensating for the fact uh, with the MBAs leveraging their experience with the undergrads compensating for the fact that they don't have any. Uh, so, that I think is the difference. I think one thing which, which kind of is revealed in, in, in your answer, Sim, like, it's very important to understand where the students are in their journey, what they know and what they're looking for. So, 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 I, so I realized this recently, like, um, like a, a friend of mine who I highly, highly appreciate is it's deeply thoughtful, taught a class at uh, like something finance related, basically at, at INSEA. It was super sophisticated. It was very, very thoughtfully, thoughtfully done. Um, and afterwards I gave the colleague feedback and I said like, you know, the way you explained the concept is absolutely fantastic. But the issue for your student is the following. Your student will work at Goldman Sachs three months from now, and they need to ask one question in that meeting that makes them look smart. And your class doesn't help them in that. They, they give like a very abstract understanding of like what happened in financial industry over the last kind of 20 years, and that's cool, but it doesn't help the student in that moment. And I'm not saying you should only kind of have a very utilitarian perspective and say like, how can I help my students at this point? But your, your idea is also to kind of give broader knowledge. Um, but to have a good understanding of where the person is at that point, where they want to go, what is kind of their goal. Um, so I spend a lot of time having lunchships with students, and I find this just incredibly helpful. Um, so, so I just suck up, like, where are they in their life? What are they looking for? And, and think about my teaching correspondingly. One, one of the tricks I've used between undergrad and MBA um, I agree with all of you that, especially for the graduate students, you want to bring into the classroom their experience. And the more, if you have lunch with them, the more you know them, you can do that. And you can make connections between different people's experiences. For the undergrads, I feel like partially because many of them, their parents are paying tuition. You know, some of them are more invested than others in their education. But I find that having more variety in the classroom seems to help. So whereas I I don't do this for my MBA students, if I have a 14 week class, usually there are two classes where I will have them do some question in in a group setting. And then there's at least two classes where I actually start the class with a worksheet. And I say, pair up with a neighbor next to you and look over these questions, which are things based on the readings that they've done, just to have a different format. And then we come together again as a group. But I find breaking up the usual trend of, you know, lecture and case um, seems to help the undergrads to that it spices it up a little bit. So um, since Amina just mentioned cases, uh, I think a lot of the questions we got uh, in the thing was about case teaching and, you know, what are some what are some best practices? How do you prepare a case? How do you teach a case? I think we had a wide range of questions about that. Uh, So. Again, uh, either Henning or Sabine, uh, thoughts on case teaching versus kind of lectures, and particularly on case teaching, yes. Sabine, you want to go ahead? Or? Um, yeah, I, I, can go, I can go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so for me, case teaching is, uh, we, we don't do as much case teaching in, in Germany as uh, you do in the US. So it will always only be like two, two or three of my classes and sort of an advanced 
a group of, of students um, and I always try and pick different cases so to cover different areas and also have a different approach of teaching the case each time because otherwise students find it boring once you get through the third uh, case. So it, it can be various sort of elements. So there can be a role play um, in, involved in this um, acting. Um, it, it can of course be sort of the, the, the discussion types where you have students work in, in groups and then report back. So you create some you know, intentional controversy over a topic if the case lends itself um, to that. But I try to bring in some variety across the cases that I, I do teach. So I do a mixture of lecture and cases with the with the majority on on lecturing probably or lecture like an in, I call it an interactive monologue. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, but I do cases. I think look, um, I think there's one aspect about cases which is very often not sufficiently leveraged um, is that what I think is super important is that the student puts him or herself into the perspective of the actual decision maker. Um, and I think, you see, so I give you a very simple example. I teach a case which has like a not so risky strategy, a ri somewhat risky strategy and a super risky strategy. And the super risky strategy clearly has kind of the way to kind of change the world and blah, 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 okay? And the students always, differ whether they should take the risky one or the super risky one. And then I point out, you know what? I would take the super conservative boring one. And I tell you why, because I have two kids and a mortgage on my apartment. And I just can't afford to kind of take some crazy risky strategy, uh, which might have a cash flow five years from now. And that kind of brings it much more into the reality um, brings it much more into the reality of the student. And to, you're saying like, I think the problem with cases is that people treat cases like theory. They have like a bird's eye perspective to it. They're like, ah, oh, yeah, somebody in 2005 thought about creating a startup, okay? And I think what they should really think about, you are now in that spot and you need to deal with all the emotional pressures. You need to deal with family requests, with employee requests, with all the uncertainties. How do you deal with that? I think that is where the case study can become very, very, very powerful. Samina, do you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, Sabina, well, I, I always teach with cases. Um, I feel like, especially, you know, I teach at a business school. Most of us are probably teaching at business schools that I, I agree with Henning, they have to be able to put themselves in actual real situations. I love doing this role playing and sometimes we'll have fun with it. You know, um, when I try to teach them incentives about things, I'll say, you know, Henning is, you know, the, the head of this joint venture. How is Henning feeling about this? And sometimes, you know, Henning won't even answer. It'll be other students that chime in. Oh, Henning is stressed about this or, and they have fun with it, you know, but this, this role playing, I think, really makes it feel more real. Um, and because we're an applied field, I think that's very relevant for, for many of them. Um, the other thing with, with cases, I think, is something that's very common is opening with a cold call where someone introduces the case. And I've, ma I've managed to gamify this in a way. When what I mean by that is every class I have someone open the case and it is a cold call. And this keeps everyone incentivized to be prepared, but so they don't take it personally. I don't pick someone. I use an app online called Wheel of Names, and it has everyone's names in the class in it. And you know, you push a button, and I ask another student, "Tell me when to stop." And I hit stop, but it slowly tick 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 stops, and it lands on someone, and it says "winner." So we all, <laughs> of course, everyone applauds because they are not the winner, right? That someone else is introducing the case, but it becomes actually a fun, supportive, light moment at the beginning. Um, and then that person introduces the case. So these are, again, other tricks to making cold calling not seem as you know, intimidating. Yeah, I think that's a great, great approach um, to do it, do it that, that way, especially sort of in the German environment, people hate cold calls. Um, so you could essentially end up with only having half the class next time if you sort of do that. 
Um, but uh, I think uh, this this is a great approach of having it it's more um, you know <clears throat> relatable and also in, in, in like gamified. Um, and I, I want to stress something that Asim said earlier on. It's really important to share these types of tips because even you know Henning and, and myself as advanced teachers, I mean we we still there's things that you know we might may hear or see and think, hey, this is this is a great tip um, to sort of go and, and use it. And so the teaching community, and Asim said that before, we have a great uh, sort of um, <clears throat> amount of resources also sort of in the teaching community circle. So um, and yeah, it would, it would be great to have tips like these uh, also added to that. So thank you, Samina. I, I think I will be using that actually. <laughs> thank you. I want to talk about I want, this is completely useless, but it's funny. I once took a PhD class, which was taken by two students only. So I was one of two students and the professor insisted on using the wheel of names. What? <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still kind of- It's, it's called the coin people. <laughs> I feel like I'm traumatized by this, okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I will say, um, you know, just, just echoing some of the um, points, um, uh, I think a lot of the a lot of what I do in cases is really I, I I mean this is just maybe just a character trait but I love cases because it lets me be contrarian right so I spend a lot of my time in the case discussion pushing people on saying no I'm going to disagree with you just to kind of take the other side of the right I mean of course ideally you will get people to disagree amongst themselves but often that doesn't happen people sort of go with the sort of obvious answer right and again I mean this it's very similar, I think, in some in spirit to sort of Henning's point about, you know, people will say, oh, this is the way they should do it. And it's like, no, I'm going to actually make the argument for why you might not do it this way. And and I, I feel like a lot of the learning in cases happens from uh, even if the path not traveled is the wrong path, helping people understand how you might get to that wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, to me, is, is one of the big things about cases. So I think, you know, really actively thinking about um, and and I, I say that also because I think it's useful to think about in, in, as you prepare for cases, it's useful to think about the different, you know, ways in which the case discussion could go. Because, of course, you know, especially when you're starting out teaching a case, it's often you don't know where the discussion is going to go. After a while, you get used to it and you know people are going to, somebody's going to say this and then you go there in that direction. But especially early on, it's like, okay. And so I think it's often useful to think out what are the different sort of arguments that people could make in this in this area and then deliberately pick sometimes the argument that you don't want them to go down uh, rather than having too much conformity uh, in the initial. So I think as I think, I mean, I completely agree with the, I mean, a lot of it actually usually comes out of the role playing or comes out of the sort of assigning people groups or assigning people perspectives, but, uh, and I do that too, but, um, but I think sometimes you need to be the person pushing back to say, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is not this is talking not. about talking about pushing back. I'm going to push back a little bit against Samina, not because I disagree, but I think because it's fun. One thing I would say about the wheel of names, which I don't like, and I know Samina uses it differently. I think there's just nothing more powerful if you ask a student and say, like, now I want to hear from you for a very particular reason. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so for example, I was, I was just teaching at Wharton and I had one, one of my students was a former player of the San Francisco 49ers. Okay. And, and so, and so we are talking about like team dynamics. And then when I could say like, okay, how is this in sports team, John, can you kind of elaborate on this? Okay. Then everybody was like, oh, wow. The teacher has in mind the background of the student, that student has actually something something interesting to say so so part of what you do as a teacher is you conduct a little bit the classroom that is by the way something i think which is different for undergrads and mba students or in particular executives no offense but the students at least to you don't look that differentiated so it's very hard for you as a teacher to kind of draw on specific on specific kind of experiences um, but if I can say like, look, how does this look from the perspective of a former consultant? How does this look from a perspective of like an um, engineer on an oil platform? I think that actually brings a lot to the classroom. Yeah. yeah and just to build on that, I mean, I think for the undergrads, one of the things I, I, I do is also because of grading, but 
is, you know, often I'll get like a subset of the class to do like little mini write-ups about the case and, uh, before they kind of come into the classroom and they have to submit those to me and I read those. And so, you know, I know that there are people in the room who said something different in their write-ups and, you know, that's not cold calling because they've actually thought about it. But I will, you know, uh, I mean, I agree with Henning. I think it's hard to kind of, I think it's good in the MBA classroom, you can say, you know, tell me about your experience. But in the undergraduate classroom, I know that people had a different point of view, but they're not open to sharing it or speaking, they're not speaking up about it. And so I will kind of warm call them to say, well, you had a different perspective in your write-up that I thought was really interesting. Do you want to maybe talk about that or push back on that? So again, I think, you know, you have to think about how you can get people more engaged in the case, but also how you can actually create some of this kind of debate and discussion uh, to make the case richer. I, I should clarify, I only use, uh, because I agree with Henning completely, I only use the wheel of names for the opening <laughs> of the case. That's it. And I was just trying to say, it's not an either or, you can sort of yeah. do both depending on what is appropriate and in which situation. So that, that was the purpose of my remark. I wanted yeah. to. I use it really, it's an incentive mechanism to make sure they're prepared because no one wants to be embarrassed if the wheel of names lands on them to open the case. And it works mm -hmm. like a charm. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I do also that Asim mentioned about, you know, drawing out students is I always have some soft questions that there's no right or wrong answer to bring out the student who is more quiet or more nervous. So let's say I'm teaching a case on Walmart. I might say, Amy, would your grandmother want to be a greeter at Walmart right now? Again, this is an opinion question. It's not even about Amy. It's about Amy's grandmother. Right. Mm -hmm. And so having some of these soft kind of not right or wrong answer questions where students can participate and not feel embarrassed, judged, have to show their intelligence, et cetera, especially for undergrads. I find that's really useful, but e even for some graduate students, right? Culturally, some people also um, don't necessarily, you know, they're the students who lightning fast raise their hands and it doesn't give some of those other students an opportunity. So sometimes calling, cold calling, but with these soft questions is helpful. And I also do one other thing where there, because of those lightning fast students, I will very often say someone other than Sarah, you know, and, and everybody laughs and smiles. And I'm like, Sarah, I love you, but somebody else just to make the point that I've heard a lot from Sarah and I want to give someone and just those 30 seconds, give someone else their opportunity to, to raise their hand. So. All right, let's 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 go on to research because that's what takes up a lot of our lives and time. But how do you incorporate your research into your classroom? Henning, you wanna go first with that? How do you bring it into the classroom? Um, I'll answer the question, but I think it's super important to also take your teaching into your research. I think people think, I think it's very often difficult to bring your research into your teaching, but actually to come up with new research question in your teaching, I find easier. Um, so, so just as a, as a perspective, I think, I think we often think about this as a one-way street, um, but it should, it's really in many ways, like a, like a two-way street. I remember GP Eggers at some point said this where it was like, Hey, um, the student asked me this question. I didn't know the answer. And that became like this paper or something like that. Um, you see, I think, um, here's something very important to keep in mind about this. So first of all, I think that transfer from research to teaching is completely overestimated. Um, I think people vary enormously about bringing their research into it, in particular in the early stages. Um, and in the early stages, you really, you really kind of, you see, like if you are in your seventh year at Harvard Business School, you really want to make sure that you kind of design a class around your research. And, and I think, and I think it's great that if you do this, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think in the long term, everybody should do this. In the beginning, I think like get a class that somehow works. Um, and here's the thing, teaching tends to be rather broad, right? I'm in charge of a strategy class, often entrepreneurship class, okay? Even if I think highly of my research, my research is going to play a role of like 0.01% of the body in that work. So I find it a little bit too egocentric to kind of make it purely around my research. I bring in a paper here and there, okay? Where I would say like, okay, I don't, I would, but like, you know what? Um, of the X number of slides I have today, there could be one slide about my research, which is kind of interesting. So, so I think it's good to bring it in, 
but I would also lower a little bit the pressure in particular early on to design the whole thing around, around you. It also, by the way, with what Sabine said in the beginning, like you can be over-prepared and you can be a little bit kind of stuck in it, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you're too focused on your research um, in your teaching, you actually kind of multiply that danger enormously. Yeah. So great to bring in small pieces, but I would be careful not to, I think people sometimes try to overdo it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I have to say that that's, I mean, coming back to the differences, undergraduate, graduate students. So with undergraduate students, because you're even sort of, you know, you, for them sort of an academic paper might not be what, you know, it's sort of the, the reading they get interested in. So our job over time is sort of to, to create the conditions, but also maybe help them understand research and that research doesn't necessarily have to be mine. It could be also someone else's that is super relevant uh, in a particular context. And as Henning said, I mean, you know, we, we, we are so many researchers that our own research might just make up a, a tiny a fraction where well, I can sort of bring in uh, my research is in advanced seminars that are actually research seminars. And um, so I can then sort of uh, assign readings that also relate to what um, I'm interested in. But when it comes to undergraduate teaching, there's very little opportunity and there's even a danger of, um, you know, creating an envi learning environment for students that is not very helpful for them. Um, but I think when it comes to, I mean, what, what Henning said, um, taking things back um, from the teaching into the research. I mean, that has uh, occurred to me multiple times. So there is some sort of two-way two -way street here. And I find this sort of super interesting. But I would fully relate to what Henning said, don't overdo it. Um, first get sort of think of what the, the good content is for the students and try and make this engaging. And if your research sort of happens to fit in, fine. But chances are it will not, or just, you know, a tiny piece like a slide or so, or some good example that you have worked on, or some empirical study that, you know, is insightful. Seems. I mean, so I, I guess I'm going to echo a couple of points, right? So one, um, I want to really echo the point that, you know, bringing research into teaching and bringing your research into teaching is not the same thing, right? So I use a lot of research into teaching, but I don't, it's not necessarily my research. Uh, I will often, I think more, if, more often than not, it's other people's research, but it's kind of recent work that I think is really exciting. Uh, I think, you know, if I think about my class, the person whose name comes up most is probably Todd Zenger or someone, right? Just saying, okay, there's a whole bunch of fascinating things that Todd has done recently that I, that I, that I love teaching, right? Um, so, uh, so, so I think, you know, I, I tend to have, I think in, especially for the MBA program, I tend to have like a little research snapshot in every session, which says, hey, here's something new that you might find fun to learn about. And it's not, they're not reading the paper or anything. They're just getting a quick one or two slides about it. But but as I said, sometimes it's my research. Uh, actually, to Henning's point, increasingly as, I, as I've kind of progressed, it's I, I have become more egocentric. So it is increasingly my research. But when I started out, it was almost never my research because I didn't have any research to talk about, right? Or I only had a couple of random papers to talk about. Um, but the other the point about the, the other thing I want to echo is the point about the two-way street. And I would take it a step further than, you know, I, I uh, then saying, yeah, you know, you heard about it. I mean, I, so I agree with that. I think you can get, you know, sparks for new ideas in teaching that you can then take to your research. Uh, but, you know, I, I teach a PhD seminar on, on um, engaged scholarship uh, that I inherited from Andy Vanderven. And, you know, one of my approaches there, on the points I make there is, you know, we are starting a new research project. What I tend to do is ask myself the question, could if this project worked out, could I take something from it and take put it in, teach it in an MBA classroom? Right. And if the answer to that question is no, then you have to ask, why the hell am I doing this? Right. What's the point of doing this research if there's nothing that an MBA student or a, ma a manager would find interesting about this? Right. Uh, and you know, I'm not saying sometimes I've done projects where I know the answer to that is no, but hey, it's a publication is a publication. But I think for the most part, I think it's a good discipline to ask ourselves, is this work going to translate into something that might actually not in the sort of, you know, like just the sort of main message of that work? Can I see myself standing in front of an MBA classroom and saying this? Uh, 
with it being interesting to them and then not laughing at me saying that's completely ridiculous why would you think this is at all true and and i think that actually is a good discipline uh that helps us to do better work in 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 the research we do uh in making it more engaged and making it more uh valuable so i i do think there is this i absolutely agree that there is a two way street and i think some of it just comes from thinking ahead about you know what is the kind of research you're doing and how does that speak to teaching so i think it's similar to a theme that i i actually always bring research but into into each class for both my undergrads and grad students but not necessarily my own but i think as you're teaching more electives that are geared around what you also study it will naturally become you have more of your own research that you can bring into the classroom <laughs> One of the ways I do it, even for really for both both groups, is I'll present our hypotheses and alternative hypotheses, which is what we really are testing. And I'll ask them to commit to which one they think is, is correct. So I'll give you a simple example. I might say, um, are, are, are firms better off allying with multiple partners or with only a few partners? And I'll say everybody that thinks um, having only a few partners is more likely to lead to some performance benefit you know, raise your finger one and everybody who thinks having many partners is better, say two. And it becomes a, a little, again, fun, interactive thing where I say everybody has to commit. So everybody has to put up one or two. And the students who have a strong feeling do it right away. Some of the laggards are looking around the room because they don't want to, if everybody's saying two, they don't want to be the only one saying one. But usually there's some difference of opinions. And I'll ask them, why, you know, are you guys supporting that it's going to be helpful this way or that way. And it gets engagement. And then I can show them the research of what we found to be the case. And sometimes it's my own research. Sometimes it's someone else's. And I actually look out for this when I'm at Academy or SMS. When people are presenting, sometimes I'll say, oh, that's a cool slide. And I'll email Asim and say, Asim, can you send me that slide? Because I want to show it in my class on divestitures. Um, and I do this a lot with a lot of different uh, colleagues. And I find it, again, makes what we do as research real for the students. And once, again, it's simplified for them, sometimes it might just be a graph or a table. It really can be very impactful. So I bring it in to um, both both my undergrad and my grad students. I, I will say Samina has never actually done this. So uh, you're clearly doing it to other people, but not doing it to me, which I'm deeply offended by. But anyway, um, so I'm mindful of the fact that- we're Same for hitting... me. Samina has never-, has never Yeah, been. see, That's I think it. you and I, we should form a club. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So uh, I, I I do I am mindful of the fact that we're kind of heading up to the one hour. So here's what I I know we have some other questions, but I think we can deal with them in the Q and A. Here's what I'd like to do in the last five minutes we have of our sort of uh, just going around the just going through the panel, maybe starting with Sabine. If you know we've talked about a lot of different topics, but if you had one other thing that we've not talked about, one tip, one sort of suggestion, thing you you wish you'd known when you started teaching. What would that be? Yeah, I, I can tell you that it's uh, the it's day one of class because you really need to think on how you want to run your class and what things you want to allow in class and what things you don't want to allow in class. So in terms of you know expectation, your expectations towards the students and you know and um, because anything you don't or any rule you don't set in the, on the first day is really difficult to implement further down the line. And when I was a junior teacher, I didn't know this. Um, and so I always thought, oh, don't be too strict today. If I want to, I mean, in Germany, students are not always on time, although we are in Germany and we have this myth, <laughs> you know, Germans being on time, but that's not actually the case. But I like to start on time. I like students to be there. And so I have to find some, and also do it in a charming way. Um, but if I don't do this on the first day, it will never happen through throughout the semester. And I wish I had known that uh, when I started teaching because it makes my life uh, so much easier, uh, easier since, since I've known this. And it also goes for other things like expectations that students have come to class prepared and you know all these other um, things. And think about it, what is important for you? Everyone is sort of different as a teacher as well. So others might not be concerned about this. So then don't bother, but you might have other things that you feel are important to your students. You know? And on the first day, they're all looking out for you to give them structure, for you to give them sort of the, the, the frame 
Um, and so that's your chance to frame it in a way, you know, that, that works. So if you want students to become engaged, force them to become engaged. If you don't do this on day one, they will all sit back and wait for you to do things. So that's, that's, that's my, my big tip. <laughs> I have more, but <laughs> I would. I'll say, I'll say two things. The one thing where I would like to follow up, because we said that you want to learn from others, but I think for some people that's actually hard, depending on the institution where you end up. I would actually make use of online teaching. Um, so, so I'm teaching a webinar online. If you're interested, go on my website and you can, can sign up for free. And I've done this with other professors. I can now sit in other pro professors' class who are normally not accessible, right? These sessions are fine. But honestly, you might have benefited as much if you had seen me an hour of teaching. Um, so in my case, if you want to see it, like go on my website, sign up for a webinar I teach. Um, the, the, the one webinar is for free, so you can sign it up. Um, the other thing I would say, look, we've talked a lot about how important it is. I think it's incredibly important to be efficient about it. So, so think about what are things you can do to be efficient. I give you a simple example of a very senior scholar um, who I learned from, and she always said, saying, you know what, I don't have office hours, but I'm around after class as long as you want. And so students got asked questions. There was no limitation of questions, but it was this one big block for her. Um, and then she was basically done with teaching except these kind of teaching blocks. Um, when you kind of give assignments, Think about who will grade those, how those will be graded, how much effort this will take. So um, you see, like um, when you do the lunches, don't do lunches one on one, do lunches with seven students, right? Or five that you have two next to one another and three on the other side. And if you have five, people feel they have a good interaction with you, um, but you can't have lunch with every student. So be um, don't answer emails within five minutes because then you end up in a ping pong match. OK, um, even if you can answer immediately, delay the answer by like half a day because you don't, the student is going to move on. So so that's it. Like, I'm not going to go through all of the tricks and like what makes you efficient. Yeah, that's, that's so, so many. Also for, for, for emails, for instance, especially if, if a student is unhappy, it, it, I we also give this advice, let it sit for a day or two, because also emotions will have calmed down on the other side. Yeah. Um, and so your message uh, will be much, much more receptive. Uh, one other thing I would uh, also like to add, we have this uh, series uh, that the teaching community has been running for quite some time, talking about how to turn teaching failures into successes. Just the interesting thing is we all believe there's like best practices, and if you just do them, things will run sort of smoothly. But we've all had our moment, let's face it, where you know your course falls apart in the middle of the, the semester. Um, and we, we don't talk about this very rarely. And in, um, at SNF in Berlin, we started a series uh, with sort of super senior scholars uh, that really shared sort of these moments that. Um, you know, sometime down the line, this is where you really learn because you're asking yourself, it's like, how could I have changed this? Um, and, um, you know, nowadays I always welcome these, these moments because they give me a chance of, to, to rethink my course strategy, for instance, or to bring in a new element to get students sort of engaged. And so this has turned into a series. We have, we, um, for, at the next SMS, we'll be talking about creativity in the classroom and essentially letting go. Um, but there's also some recordings from the virtual um, SMSs. Um, from, and uh, we also, we, we produced the book because we thought, you know, panels is one thing or like you know, now we have the recordings. But there's also like lots of tips. And again, there's so many resources uh, out there. Um, so just go, go and grab them. Um, I would... <laughs> I guess I, I would say two, two things that I use as, as good practices that work for me. For my classes, I think, again, setting the tone that Sabine mentioned is very important the first day. And I think teaching or treating the students with respect, but having them treat each other with respect is something that I like to, to establish the very first day. So I say this on the first day, I say, this is like a business meeting. And I say, I'm maybe your boss or I'm the moderator of our discussion, but this is a, a setting where you may disagree with each other. You're welcome to also disagree with me, but your feedback needs to be constructive. 
And like any business meeting, you know, if you need to take a break and go to the restroom, you're going to do it as, you know, quietly as you can so as not to disrupt the rest of the meeting. Um, we expect to start on time because you're going to value everyone else's time. You're not going to disrespect everyone's time. And I have this trick I do. I always start class five minutes after the posted time. And I tell them that on the first day. I'll say, look, some of you are taking the train. Some of you picking up a Starbucks coffee. I'm giving you all five extra minutes, but that means five after everybody needs to be in their seats because our meeting is starting. And usually it, it works. Nobody is later than those five minutes because I've given them that extra buffer. Um, so they can't really argue with me that I haven't. So that's one thing is setting up this tone of, of what you want your class to be like. Um, the second I would say is less is more or quality over quantity. I kind of cringe now when I look at my early years as a professor, how much I tried to pack into a class or put on the slides. Um, now, like Henning mentioned, we have many other tools where I can you know, have videos for them to watch or give them slides to look at later. But in the classroom, I want as much engagement and I wanna make sure there's some key points that they all understand well, instead of knowing a lot of different things. So less is more. Asim? Hey, you just stole my point. Anyway, um, uh, I would say authenticity. I mean, I think, I think the, to me, I think being a, being a good teacher is about being your authentic self in front of the classroom, right? I don't think you can, you can't be someone you're not, uh, right? So again, I mean, I think, yes, you want to look at other people and you want to learn from other people. And I, I completely agree with that. But I think you have to figure out what works for you. So for example, like, you know, I don't actually care if people come late. I don't care if people are spending their time on their cell phones or whatever. I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm like, yeah, okay. You don't want to learn anything from this class. That's totally fine with me. And I say that up front, like you, you don't want to come to class. I don't care. You don't want to, you want to sit in the back of the class and play and shop for shoes. I don't care. Right. I'm here to help you learn. If you don't want to learn, I, it's not no skin of my nose, right. I'm getting paid anyway. Too bad. <laughs> I'm here for the people who want to learn and I'm very happy to engage with them. And that's, so again, I'm not saying everybody should do that. My whole point is everybody shouldn't do that. I think if you are the kind of person whom that is true, you want to do that. If you're the kind of person who doesn't, who, who, who really kind of gets upset about the fact that someone walks in a minute late to the class, then you want to set that expectation. So, so I think it, it really is about figuring out what works for you. I, as you've probably figured out by now, I use a lot of humor in my class, but that's just me, right? Like, I know that doesn't work for everyone, but it works for me. Uh, I can't pull off the whole, I'm so authoritative, you know, like I have senior colleagues, you know, my shaver acts who pull off gravitas. I can't do that, right? They kind of stand there and they sort of deliver. I mean, Axe will do his Shakespearean monologues and that works for him, but it doesn't work for me. So you have to figure out what works for you and who you are. And I think it's very hard. I think it particularly because it's very hard to try to be someone you're not while you're actually engaging with the classroom. If you try to be someone you're not, you're not really going to be listening to what people are saying. You're mm -hmm. going to be delivering this canned content. But in order to really engage with the classroom, you have to first be comfortable in your own skin. And I think yeah. figuring out what that looks like for you would be my sort of big, big sort of tip. Um, Absolutely. But, but, uh, but for me, so for instance, this thing about time, it also relates to, I think, what is important for my students. And if I can teach a class with 300 students and I have like, you know, half of them running in and out that just, you know, creates an atmosphere with fellow students that makes it difficult. And I've had feedback in the evaluation that students really appreciate this. Uh, again, I'm, I, I also tell them I'm not bothered if you... If you don't, you know, want to feel you want to participate today, please, you know, I'm. It's totally fine not not to come to class, but let the ones that are here, you know, I want to create a learning environment that they find beneficial. With smaller classes, uh, I don't care um, either. I teach all my classes very differently, so that's always super surprising for students who've done one class with me, and then um, it might be totally different. But it depends on the setting, uh, on on what I want to achieve. Um, in the classroom and so I always think it's like what is important what do I want to keep through the you know through the course and so I make sure I set the expectations on day one 
Okay, um, so uh, thanks uh, thanks for that and thanks to the panelists. Um, so I think we're at the point, actually, we're still past the point where uh, I think we're ready to start on some of the Q&A. And I know there's uh, four questions that have been posted uh, in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, go, actually, before we stop the recording, let me just quickly, uh, I don't know that any of our PhD champions are on the call here. Um, let me just put out a quick plug for... Uh, the PhD member circle. Uh, if you're a PhD student and you're not part of the PhD member circle, I strongly uh, suggest signing up for that. Uh, we will post a rec this recording on the, we'll post it on the SMS website, but it'll also be available. There's a whole collection of these recordings on the PhD member circle. Uh, so you can go uh, look that up. 